without the team, without the people. I mean, you can have the best technology, you can have the most skilled individuals, but without people working together, you're not going to get the job done. The same in a restaurant, right? You could have the most creative, the most skilled chef, but unless you have all of the other parts, unless you have the server, unless you have the line cook, you're not going to be able to give that amazing experience to your customers. Welcome to The Profitable Table, fed by Woolco Foods, the nation's first podcast devoted to the business and lifestyle of the hospitality industry. Now, here's your host, Woolco Foods CEO, Stephen Toberoff. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Profitable Table, fed by Woolco Foods. I am your host, Stephen Toberoff, and today is a real treat for me because I have an opportunity to interview somebody who's not only an important thought leader and innovator in the hospitality industry, but someone who's a friend and a friend that I made during uh, what was a very interesting and short-term challenging time. And I'm just so delighted that uh, she came in and I have the opportunity to speak with her. And so my guest is Constance Van Stroud, who is product manager of Choco. Connie, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Thanks so much, Stephen. It's wonderful to be on this podcast. (laughs) This was really great. Just real quick backstory. Connie and I met last March or April. I received an email, and I'm fortunate for me that I answered it because I'd never (laughs) heard of Choco before, and I wasn't sure what it was. And I answered this email, and it started a, a working relationship and then a friendship. So, Connie, can you tell us a little bit about Choco and then a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with them. Absolutely. I would love to. So Choco is a ordering platform which connects restaurants and suppliers together. And for restaurants, we enable them to basically order and connect with all of their suppliers in one application, whereby usually they might have to send an email, text, or even fax sometimes to 10 different suppliers, which is huge time waste and and takes up a lot of headspace. And for suppliers, we try and consolidate all of their orders onto one platform to make uh, customer and order management a little bit easier. So we started out actually about three and a half years ago in Berlin, Germany, Uh, so a long way from here. And we expanded rapidly throughout Europe and also in the U.S. So we're currently in every single major U.S. city in America, which is really exciting. And I've got the pleasure to be in New York today. Usually I'm based in Berlin, and as you said, I'm a product manager And my main responsibility is to understand within the product what we should build and how we should build it. And really the focus here is on what value can we create for our customers? What do they want to see and what pain points are they currently experiencing? And this is for both current customers and also new customers. We want to really be that technology leader and help drive change in a supplier and also a restaurant's business. Then, yeah, so once we've decided, okay, what value can we create here? um, We figure out how technically we can build it. And then I oversee the building of this feature and the rollout of it to our customers. What was so cool is when you and I met Connie, it was at a moment in time when restaurants, not just in New York City, but around the world were shut down. And working with you, we built, you guys built, I mean, we we had a Shopify account, but what you guys built was really special. And I think it was one of those crazy moments in time when Amazon and Fresh Direct were unable to deliver to the people's houses for five days, and we could do it the next day. And you guys built that app. I think we turned it around in two days, and we started delivering to people's homes. But what I love about Choco and what I really valued about you guys and why I value our friendship is you guys, in addition to creating this solution, you have a core value that underpins Choco, as I remember, which is food waste Mm. and I think that's so important. Can you talk a little bit about that aspect of Choco? Yeah, absolutely. So basically our big mission is that we look at the current crisis in in the world right now. One of the main crises is is, is global warming. And actually a core facet or core reason behind driving this environmental catastrophe is food waste and food waste that happens within the supply chain. When we talk about the food supply chain, we talk about from a producer level to then the end consumer And obviously, one of the key end consumers are restaurants, but also everyday consumers like you and I. And what you see is a lot of inefficiencies throughout the supply chain and a big disconnect from the producer level to the consumer. So often, you and I don't know where 
where our food comes from, right? And at each stage when the food is transported and also sold, the systems aren't speaking to one another. Like the technology stacks don't exist. There's no connecting piece of data that covers the whole food supply chain. And as a result of this, inefficiencies happen. And this is where the food waste happens. An example is like, let's take a real life example. A chef, for example, places an order. They're from Mexico and they've got a very strong accent. And they place an order over the phone to, for you guys, your office hours have closed. They leave a voice note. And it's pretty difficult to understand. They're in the back office, they're in, sorry, in the back of the kitchen and the signal's bad. And the next morning, your customer service team come in and are trying to decipher this voicemail. And it's pretty difficult to do. So you have to guess a lot of what the products are, ship the delivery and say there's a lot of fresh stuff, a lot of produce. Then the customer gets some incorrect products, for example. And with this, a lot of food is wasted. And this is just one example that I give, but this is happening at every single stage across the supply chain. Absolutely. And I think that one of the things that really came to the forefront during the pandemic was the importance of being able to communicate in a variety of different ways. And I think that you're absolutely right. Anything that can streamline that and enhance accuracy is crucial. Now, something I'm very curious about, because you have visibility, Choco has visibility really around much of the world in Europe, the United States. And now is a very different place than when we were in March. I'm wondering, and I think the audience would be very interested in hearing, are there any new trends, behaviors, disciplines, things that you've changed that you think are going to be lasting that came out of what we've been through over the past year and a half? That's a really good question. So first off, I'd like to say that even though we work in all of these different markets, there's a huge number of similarities. Actually, there's far more similarities than than there are differences, which is uh, pretty interesting if you consider like the diversity of it. You you go from America to, for example, Germany or France, and you walk along the street and you feel like it's a pretty different place. But actually, when you look at the the supply chain and when you look at how restaurants buy from suppliers and also how suppliers send products to restaurants, it happens in a remarkably similar way. And I think one thing that we see that's changed massively as a result of the pandemic is the increase in technology from both the supplier side and also for for restaurants. Um, During the pandemic, everything went online. And so people were forced to change the way they did things. And I'm sure you guys also changed the way uh, you communicated and sent orders to customers. And that's how we started working together, right? We we helped set up this this website um, and sent home deliveries and... That was in part as well to make sure that there was no wasted stock if we're going back to the, the food waste topic because suddenly overnight all the restaurants closed and, and we had to you guys had to shut everything down. And so it's like, how can we sell off this produce so it doesn't get wasted? And so that's I think the the most noticeable shift and the awareness that's created within people who may not typically have relied on technology and have been stuck in their sort of old ways and um, really saw the value of how much more efficiency it can bring. And I think efficiency is a huge thing because one of the biggest challenges that the hospitality space is still dealing with is staffing. And I would be curious, with the mobile app, do you find that it's a tool that's most utilized? Because one of the things that's happened is restaurants are trying to get their staff, in many instances, to do as much as they possibly can. And you have people doing two, three, four types of different things. Do you find that the food ordering is done traditionally by the chef Is it delegated to a sous chef? Is it done by the owner? What are your thoughts on that? Because I know, like I said, there's a lot of consolidation going on. And I think each one of those participants in a given restaurant has different objectives and different demands on their time. Yeah, that's a great question. So it's very rare, actually, especially if you have a a larger establishment, that there's only one person doing ordering or only one person involved in the ordering. And so you see typically nearly everyone in the kitchen who at some point needs to be involved, whether or not it's that they just need to know that the order's coming in or what's coming in, or whether it's like they're actually placing the order. So we try and get as many people within the, in the kitchen as part of our the onboarding on our application on Choco so we can ensure that they have that visibility, which previously they might not have had. And we have the option for a, a manager or an owner or a chef to assign basically different permission levels within the application So as a sous chef, for example, maybe your executive chef doesn't want you placing orders, but they want you starting the order. They want you editing the product list that you typically order from. And so you'd be able to do that within the application. And then the EC can take a look and say, okay, this looks good. I'm going to actually be the one placing the order. 
That's very cool. So it gives them the visibility and then people can do different tasks depending upon what permissions they're okay. given. It's also the same for um, restaurant groups, right? So like if you are a purchasing manager for say five different locations, you're able to be in all of these locations at one time. So you can just open the app, you can see each location, what kind of activity is happening, what orders are coming in, if there's any problems. And so typically actually the more people, the better, and the more value that, that's provided when, when they're on board. 100%. One of the things that I really like about what you guys are doing is pre-pandemic and certainly even to this day, there's a ton of conversation that goes around about data, using data, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a lot of it was really, for example, people were talking about how restaurants could use data so that they would know how many olives their regulars want in their martini, which to me did not seem very logical because you should know your customers. On the other hand, when you have chefs, mixologists, owners that have so much to do, they really need a technological solution. So I'm curious, as you're building this app and as you're improving it, what informs your decisions? What informs you? Are you speaking with chefs? Is it looking at other things? What informs how you build and improve on your app? So the most important thing for us is our customers and what our customers say they need. That is the number one and where we start from whenever we are thinking, okay, what do we want to build? And we get our customers are very active and also very vocal. I'm sure your customers are too. <laughs> oh, yes. oh yes. And so we get an enormous amount of feedback on what people want to see. And obviously this differs a little bit depending on the type of restaurant, um, also depending on who the request is coming from, whether it's an ECO, whether it's a, a line cook, for example. But this is like the starting point of all kind of features and, and aspects of the product that we build. And we have a very active like customer support team, both in person and also um, by the phone. And they are constantly gathering this input, which then gets fed back to our engineering team in Berlin or the product team in Berlin, which I'm part of. And we're constantly listening to what our customers are saying. One of the dynamics that I observed early on in the pandemic was every other news story was about the restaurants. I'm talking about in the States now. And so it was very clear to me, or it reinforced something I already believe, which is that restaurants, socializing, it's elemental and essential, and you realize how much people valued it. That was my experience in New York, New Jersey, the States, the part of the market I'm in. I'm curious, is it the same in the other markets you're dealing with in Europe? In other words, here, of course, there have been innovations, utilization of takeout, utilization of other tools, but the demand to go out and the demand to have those moments in restaurants and bars are there. Is it the same in Europe? Has that been the same sort of experience? It's phenomenal, really. I mean, I put a. I remember the first day that um, that restaurants opened after the pandemic in Berlin, and I remember walking along the street and just smiling because it felt like the whole city had come back alive again, and everybody was out. Like the restaurants were completely packed to the brim. A lot of new restaurants opening to kind of support the the increased demand. Also, when I went to Paris, it was the same thing there. Impossible to go out to dinner unless you had a reservation in the city. So really, you see uh, that all of the markets have bounced back at phenomenal speed, which is really amazing. Something else that I'm seeing that I really like is I did an interview several months ago with Caroline Schiff, who is the executive pastry chef at Gage and & Tallner and a terrific person. Her Instagram is is uh, at Pastry Chef. And we spent a lot of time talking about how the pandemic really exposed certain inequities and injustice within the restaurant space that I hope are getting addressed, which is that no matter what position people had or, or what their involvement was, everyone is so important. And I think people are really feeling that now with the staffing shortage. Is that been an issue? And I keep asking because I want to give our audience a feel of what's going mm. on. In America, we know, okay, these are some of the challenges. Is staffing shortages as well as that dynamic within restaurants, was that a, a topic that came up? Is that something that's still going on now? Or was that something that really was not an issue prior mm. to this whole dynamic? So the staffing issue is a global issue. It's massive. Restaurants, suppliers, like everyone is facing enormous staffing issues. I think a lot of people moved out of the industry as a result of the pandemic. So you see that, you see that everywhere for sure. And that's unequivocally the same in every single market. The inequality at which some restaurants are treated, 
I don't know the specifics behind what government support. I know that there was like quite a big relief fund set up in America and there's a lot of activity in the industry to kind of get that going. I do think that in Europe, there was a bit, the support was a bit better or a bit more accessible and I think more evenly distributed. I, I'm not sure, maybe you can enlighten me on the specifics of the US, but it sounded like there were some people which really missed out from that fund and in Europe, that wasn't the case. And actually, you didn't have so many restaurant closures that I think you, you saw here. So yeah, I'm not sure what, what, what your experience was. That's exactly. what I was hearing from chefs and others in the industry that I knew that had deep ties to Europe. I think here there was an uneven ability to access the programs that were available. And I also think in certain markets, and I had discussed this with other guests as well, you really felt, at least in New York, that, you know, for years, restaurants had been the backbone of their communities and had been there to support little leagues and block parties and, and everything. And you almost felt as if the, the local and even state government was hostile to you. you know, I remember during times like that, and I think that hopefully has abated. And I think within the restaurants themselves, there's just an overall, and this is a great thing, an overall greater appreciation and respect for everyone that's working in a restaurant. Because... That really needs to happen. There were some really horrible stories that I read in Eater, New York, about people who were here, worked their whole lives, and they were sleeping in the park because they had no way to do it and they couldn't access aid because of their status and whatnot. But I was just curious, you know, not to dwell on the negative because I do see a lot of these improvements coming, but based upon your worldwide exposure. Now, let me ask you, obviously, Choco is a tech company. Yep but it's a tech company tied to the hospitality. How many people at Choco are foodies or into the restaurants <laughs> as opposed to having their emphasis be on tech? Because it's a balancing act that I have to think about myself. Yeah. I'm in the restaurant business, but I'm also in logistics and distribution. I'm curious about that. Well, I actually do a lot of interviews. <laughs> and obviously one of the, the key interview questions you would ask anyone is, why are you applying to this company? And I think I have about 95% of people say, I just love food so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you want, right? Exactly. No, that's no, where the passion comes yeah. from. Yeah, and for me as well, that was like a key driver for sure. I mean, I have so many friends who work in hospitality and like there's so much passion in the industry. Like you, for me anyway, you don't see it anywhere else. And so I think this attracts like similarly very passionate people. So I would say, yeah, 95%, if not more. And then there's also a lot of people going back to the sustainability food waste topic especially young people now, they really feel this environmental disaster like creeping up on them and feel like the burden of this in their shoulders for our generation to solve it somehow. And so there's a lot of people who are choosing their employer based off of these ethical considerations. So that's another key reason. That's very interesting. And, and it is important. It's funny because I think what you guys are reinforcing at Choco, and, and this is true in most circumstances, but let's focus in on on what's going on from a climate standpoint, sometimes people are so eager or dialed into the big sort of demonstration, the big protest, the big movement, not realizing that the real impact is going to be our own individual decisions and actions that we can take on an individual level, a business level. And so I think reinforcing that is really important. You know, would you agree with that? Like sometimes people, I mean, you, you see the hypocrisy all the time of people taking private jets to go yeah. to meetings, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, I think for me anyway, personally, I believe that to have this big impact, you first have got to start small and you've got to work on yourself, whether that be like offsetting, you have to travel, whether that be offsetting your emissions, whether that be cutting down the amount of meat that you eat. I think for me anyway, I feel like I won't be able to make this big impact unless I make this impact on myself first. So that's very important to me. Yeah, I think personal responsibility in anything is a crucial first step and, and certainly this. And I think it is kind of cool because I'm sure there are people, I, I would, I'm certain there are people who are just super passionate about tech and using tech and being innovative, but tech is a tool and the tool is meant to help whoever's using it. And I think in order to have a, a technological tool or solution, you really have to understand and appreciate and, and care about the customer, yeah. you know, the industry. What you said as I was listening to you, which I found interesting, was that there's a lot more similarities than one might think, mm. depending on where you are. What would you say the three or two, you pick it, the most 
core similarities you see that run across all restaurants, regardless of region, regardless of country, regardless of even genre? Okay. The core similarities. Like from my perspective, one of the things that I know that I need to address that I see amongst all restaurants, again, in my market, is they all seem to be operating under some time constraints always. Yeah. There's an immediacy to this business. Yeah. It's almost like the theater business. Every night is showtime. Every night you have to raise that curtain. So you have to be very sensitive to that. In this market, I think that there's perhaps other markets where that's not the case. But from your perspective, I was just thinking in terms of what might make them want to look to a Choco solution or just what you would see in terms of how the restaurant industry operates globally. It might be helpful. Yeah, so on a very granular level, if you think about the people, I think <laughs> unanimously, there's <laughs> these people have no time. Everyone is stretched so thin. They work the most insane hours. You know, I spoke a little bit earlier about passion. It's like most people are doing this because they they love it or and they they love like creating amazing food and, and serving people and um and hosting people. So I think that's ubiquitous. And but that comes a very difficult lifestyle. There's very few hours in a day. They're working very long hours, very late hours. And ultimately placing an order, a food order is very critical because if the food doesn't come or the product doesn't come, then you're a little bit screwed for, for service the next day. But it's a sort of administrative task, right? And it can take a really, really long time. And you see before, if the sort of ordering process hasn't been optimized, it can really take up to an hour, an hour and a half every single night to place all of the supplier orders in, in an accurate way. And so I think that's, I mean, that's why I guess we've been able to grow in all of these markets is because that value has been there. So that's that's definitely one, one core one. And I think, you know, it really ties in nicely because the reason I started this podcast, Connie, was because there is a lot of content out there, a lot of great content geared for foodies and recipes and all that. But I wanted to create a podcast that would focus in part on the business side of the restaurant. And so when you're talking about the administrative thing, I think it's such an important thing to touch on a little bit here because you can have the greatest cuisine. You can have, and I'm not even talking about something as extreme as people that sometimes make the decision or the mistake of not budgeting properly or having massive financial issues. Even something that seems benign and easy, which is just getting my orders in. If you're not thinking about how to do that as well as you can, in the same way that you're thinking about preparing your dishes as well as you can, you're leaving a lot on the table. And I think it's something that everybody, because a lot of, as you know, chefs are artists, right? And if they have to do these administrative tasks, sometimes it's not a fit. But yet that doesn't mean it's any less important or essential. Mm, yeah, exactly. No, I completely agree. And the second similarity is depending on the type of restaurant, it like impacts the, the way they order. So you see restaurants that are more food focused. By food focused, I mean that they you know spend a lot of time changing their menu, making sure it is reflecting seasonality, making sure it reflects current changes, making sure they get the best quality product. With these types of restaurants, you see a much greater detail to who they're ordering from and also the number of supplies that they're ordering from. So Typically for a mission star restaurant, you know, they might have 20, 25 suppliers, whereby a local mom and pop shop might only have two or three because really they're trying to kind of optimize their purchasing power to get the best deal from, from the smallest number of suppliers. That's a very good point. It's true. We were discussing this before the podcast, how different restaurants are going to have different requirements for parts of their menu that others won't. And those differences will ultimately necessitate a wider array of suppliers, even though that can be very time consuming and, and build in a lot of soft costs to it. One of the issues that we're facing here, and I would imagine it's the case elsewhere, but I'm wondering if it's manifested itself in any of your conversations is because of inflation, right? People are looking at, at different ways to try to cut costs without quality. Is that a conversation that's going on in Europe as well? Isn't food cost inflation an issue there, or has that not really come up that much? Actually, not so much. I mean, cost is always so important. And that's another, I would say, the third similarity is like it's a business and the margins are so tight. <laughs> so it's always a big topic. But I don't think inflation is such a big issue in, in Europe. At least it hasn't been in our conversations. That's good. Because it, it has been a challenge here and it's forcing restaurants to do things 
a little bit differently. But I think the good thing for Choco is I think that the tools that are out there, if used properly, can actually help save time or perhaps even money elsewhere. So what I would just say, Connie, is like, what was so cool is I don't even remember how we met and our companies and started, but within a day of meeting, we were working together hours a day. Yeah. And that, to me, is an embodiment of an individual and a company that has a value that puts people first. And that's something that I really believe in, too. Like when this whole thing happened, people pulled around their community, they pulled around places. Within Choco itself, because, again, it's a tech company, but people don't understand tech companies are companies like like any other company. Would you say that that, that is a sort of part of the culture of the company? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So people, and this is something our, our CEO really believes strongly in, Daniel, people are everything, right? Without the team, without the people. I mean, you can have the best technology, you can have the most skilled individuals, but without people working together you're not going to get the job done. I mean, it's the same in a restaurant, right? You could have the most creative, the most skilled chef, but unless you have all of the other parts, unless you have the server, unless you have the line cook, you're not going to be able to give that amazing experience to your customers. And so it's identical for us as well. And that's why we're, we're so particular with who we hire. And we focus so much on getting people onboarded because it's most critical. It's the thing that binds everything together. Now, I'm curious because... I live in New York, well, New Jersey now, but I was born and raised in New York. I lived in Chicago. <laughs> so I, I want to, for myself, if you were to describe to somebody, because I know you lived in Chicago, you've spent time in New York, how would you describe the two cities in oh, terms of being question. different to each other, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to get <laughs> your question. perspective, and then I'll share mine after you. Yeah, great question. I remember I remember how I felt very vividly. So I was in Chicago for a year with Choco, and I love the city. I love the people. I think there's a lot of warmth there, a lot of openness. And I have a lot of good friends still there, even though I haven't been, been back for, for two years. And then I remember arriving in New York and I was phoning around. I was trying to meet some people, establish some business relationships. And it was just nobody cared. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much like, and usually, you know, I've got a bit of an accent. Uh, I'm English uh, for all of those who, ha- who didn't uh, detect that by now. And so usually this worked pretty well. I was also in San Francisco before for Chicago and the same same thing there a little bit, actually. People were very interested about where I was from and also the fact that we were originally a, a German company and we're also now an American company, of course, as well. And this was quite a good conversation starter. And then from there, people were always interested to learn what we were doing. And then I got to New York and... There was silence. Nobody cared. Everyone was so busy, so crazy doing their own thing that there was no, felt like there was no room to start that relationship. And that's why I was so pressed with Walker and with you, Stephen, because during that really difficult time when we started working together, you guys were so quick to try something new and to try something new for your customers, but also for a new type of customer and to make things work. And that really, to me, shows that that you guys are an innovative company and willing to, to do anything and go that extra mile for your customers. So I would say that that really restored my perception of uh, New Yorkers. <laughs> uh, I appreciate that. What about you? <laughs> I would say for me, I love Chicago and I love New York. I was born and raised in New York and I lived in Chicago for five years. But what I love about Chicago, I, I love both cities, but what makes Chicago such a cool city for people who may not have visited is you have the Art Institute, which is a magnificent museum. You've got the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. You've got all that great art stuff. But as someone who also enjoys sports, the great thing about Chicago, I'll never forget this, is on the news every night during football season, you could have the most significant global event occurring, and they're going to lead with something to do. Like if the offensive lineman of the Chicago Bears uh, has a pulled hamstring, that's the lead story. By which I mean in Chicago, it just does feel like there's a lot more common interest and everybody has that thing right when you meet them. Whereas in New York, it's a little bit different. I also felt like in Chicago, everybody knew everyone in hospitality anyway. Yeah. You were maybe one person removed from pretty much knowing anyone. It was really unbelievable in restaurants and also in in food service and wholesale. But in New York, it's not the case whatsoever. No. And I actually, I worked for a company in Chicago called Let Us Entertain You. Oh, yeah. So I worked there when they opened up their new concept in Water Tower. This is going back many, many years. And I learned a lot from that. And I think you're right. I mean, the restaurant scene in Chicago is phenomenal and it's constantly changing, but I do agree with you. I think people might be a little bit more 
familiar with each other and, and that whole thing. And I appreciate what you said. You know, it's interesting because I remember when we were doing the home delivery, everybody was excited and they were thinking, oh, this is going to be a phenomenal new revenue stream for us. And I was like, guys, at some point, Amazon yeah. and uh, these guys are going to be back <laughs> online and we're going back to what we do. But it was such a great learning experience. And I appreciate what you're saying. I think in business and in life, if you're not open to new things, if you're not open to listening, you're really not serving yourself. Because how are you going to grow? How are you going to evolve, right? Yeah. Especially with today's world, but everything is changing so quickly. Things are going online so quickly. I mean, you saw this with restaurants as well. Those who adapted and, and went to do food delivery and and they also tried doing pickup. They would uh, sell basically turn into a kind of convenience store. And I think there was like a bunch of other you know, innovative things that people came up with. Even if they're not doing that now, right, it like helped them during that time. And ultimately, probably they learn a lot from it. Definitely. I would say to anyone who's listening, who's starting out in this industry or is just an entrepreneur in general, a lot of times people are closed-minded as a defense mechanism. I never understood it. Maybe people don't like to be perceived as not knowing something or whatever. But I think being open-minded and trying new things is great because it's just what you said. If nothing else, we all needed meaningful work to do at that point. I mean, I remember being engaged, being on the phone with you, being on with the team. It was a great relief and learned a lot. And who knows, one day an opportunity might come along where we could introduce that. So that was really cool. You know, with that, Connie, I would just like to end with one final question, which is, if you were to pick, I don't want to put you on the spot, so I'm <laughs> going to give you an out for this, but I'm going to put you on the spot and then you could take a sidetrack. What's your favorite restaurant? And if you don't want to say that, what's your favorite meal? If you could have any meal in the world or what's your favorite restaurant? One place that just stands out. I've, I've actually got a place on the tip of my tongue. Please. It's a restaurant called Lamelo in, in New York. Well, I have to pick New York. I can't. Otherwise, there's no, too, too many restaurants to choose from. <laughs> and I actually went to meet the chef there, a lovely guy called Ophir, for a business meeting. And he told me in advance, I had no prior conversation with him. He sent me a message saying, okay, come at lunchtime. I thought, okay. I came and I was there ready, very excited to tell him about Choco. And he said, hang on a second. Are you hungry? <laughs> <laughs> And then for the next hour, he continued to bring me out pretty much every dish that was on the menu, telling me with every dish that, that he gave, you know, the story behind it and how it was made and the passion and the enjoyment that he got me, a complete stranger, and how important it was for him before we started working together for me to try what he was doing and to understand what he was doing. That experience was really unforgettable for me. And... I've been back there many times and it's been the same every time. And I can see it's not just for me, it's for every single customer, the passion. And he just thinks totally about, you know, we've mentioned this a lot, totally about the customer. And he just loves making people feel good through his food. And so that, that very personal experience and also their food is unbelievable. It's a be amazing Israeli food. I really recommend it to anyone who hasn't been. <laughs> That's awesome. And yeah. what what's so cool as I'm listening to you is, you mentioned the fact that it was great food after talking about how passionate he was yeah. and the stories <laughs> about it. No, but it's really true. It's it's a lesson we talk about a lot, and it's an important one to always reinforce. Even in the restaurant industry, the human-to-human -human interaction, the people, the stories, the connection is what lasts and something that we should never lose sight of. And I certainly have, and I'm glad that we made a connection, Connie, and I'm so glad that you came here today and we did this podcast. Yeah, it was thank a spur you. of the moment. It was. <laughs> but it was great. So any event, for people that are interested, please follow them on Instagram at Choco, C-H-O-C-O. -O. And there's also a meme, and I'm going to ask you to pronounce it. <laughs> August Sloop? August Gloop. August Gloop. And you could check them out there. Very cool app and a very cool company. And Connie, this was such a pleasure, so thank I you, really Steven. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Profitable Table, fed by Woolco Foods. Please be sure to rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. And to learn more about Woolco Foods or Stephen Toberoff, please visit us at woolcofoods.net.